Hello students, welcome back. This is your science teacher, Ben. And we are in the middle of this third chapter that is metals and non-metals. And in the last class we have stopped. Uh, we, okay, I gave you an introduction about uh, an ionic bond and covalent bond. And uh, today we'll study this uh, example of ionic bond and also as well as we'll study the properties of ionic compound, clear? So now ionic bond, I have given example of NaCl and there's a certain bond or force, it's, it's, it's there between this compound. That's why we have uh, two, two elements coming together, right? So now last, uh, in the last class, I have given home assignment to refer to the periodic table as well. Now, uh, periodic table, separate chapters, particularly we have on five, the, the fifth chapter is all about periodic tables. But uh, I'm giving you all these details because the key, the concept is the same, clear? So, NaCl, there's a bond between sodium and chlorine. What kind of bond? Ionic bond. So, now in the last class I have given the electronic configuration of sodium that is 281 and we have for chlorine that is 287 and having said that uh, in a periodic table we have 18 group we have 18 group in the periodic table So we have uh, 18, 18 groups starting from the first group till we have 18 group. And when we talk about periods, we have, okay, one, two, three, we have till seven period, clear? So we have seven period and 18 group. And the group 18 is referred as the stable, the most stable one, and they're also known as the noble gas. Noble gas, okay? So this one we'll study more details in the fifth chapter. Now, let's take an example here. We have helium, okay? We have helium, we have here neon, and we have here argon. So suppose if I write the electronic configuration for neon, which is uh, the, the atomic number is 10, then for neon, the electronic configuration is 2, 8. That means the outermost uh, shell, we have eight electron. That means they are uh, they they are the most stable one, and they are obeying this octet rule. Eight means octa, right? So octet rule. So because they have eight in the outermost shell. Now, if I if let's say argon, argon, if we count from here, it's at eighteen. The atomic number is eighteen. And if I have to write the electronic configuration for argon, it, it would be 2, 8, 8, 8, 2, 10, plus 8, 18. So see, now for all this group, if you go down, except for helium, the helium, the atomic, the configuration is just 2, but still it's obeying the, uh, the duplet rule. It's, it is stable, 2 and 8. So now if we go on, the outermost shell, what we get to see is we get to see 8, 8, 8, 8. So what all these elements they try to do is they try to become like this group to become settled. Now, so when we look here, sodium, no, the outermost shell is 1. Chlorine, it is 7. So what they try to do, sodium wants to throw this one so badly because by throwing this one, he will complete the goal. Now, chlorine needs one very badly because if he gets one, that means he will become eight. So now you remember this way. If you give something to other, you get a plus point, clear? And if you take something from other, you get a minus. Giving plus taking minus. You just remember this concept, just concept. So now, see, sodium, 
he gives one electron transfer, okay? Transfer one electron to chlorine. How many electrons? Just one electron to chlorine. So he gives one, that's why giving is a good point. Giving, he gets a plus charge. Now chlorine needs one, right? So he takes the one from sodium. So taking is minus. How many? One. So that's why we have Na plus and Cl minus. So that's how a bond is formed. So sodium is giving and then chlorine is receiving. So sodium has a plus charge, now minus. So in this way, an ionic bond is formed. Clear? So that's why uh, they are together and they have a very strong force be uh, bond between the, uh, the ionic bond. Clear? Okay, so uh, uh, students, I'll give you another example for uh, ionic bond that will be magnesium chloride, MgCl2. So here, whatever compound that we see, uh, they, they are bonded together by either ionic bond or covalent bond, clear? But now we are concerned about the ionic bond here. So we have magnesium chloride. How this bond was formed? Let's take... Uh, let's see here in the peri periodic table. Magnesium has an atomic number 12. So magnesium would be here. Clear, yeah, students? Magnesium would be here. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So magnesium, uh, the atomic number is 12. So how do you write the electronic configuration? Now, the, in the first shell, we have only two. One, two, right? So two. Now the second one, we have 2 plus 6, 8, right? 8. Now the outermost shell, since magnesium, the atomic number is 12, so now it's here. 1, 2. So that means 8 plus 2, 10. 10 plus 2, 12. So now we have the electronic configuration for magnesium. Clear? And the chlorine, we have, we have two chlorine here. So chlorine, the, atom, uh, the configuration is the same thing, 2, 8, 7. But if we uh, look here, we have two chlorine, okay? We have two chlorine, 2, 8, 7. Now, in this case, students, uh, magnesium, in order to complete an octet, uh, six, taking 6 will give 8, clear? If I add 6 here, it will become 8, but that is not possible. Clear? So the, most, the easier one would be to throw this 2 to become an 8. Clear? Throwing 2 is easier for magnesium instead of taking another 6. So chlorine, the same thing, they need one badly. They need, they need one here. So now magnesium would transfer this 2 electron here. One, one each here. So that means magnesium is giving how many electrons? Two. So if I'm giving means, I'm, I'm giving means I get a plus charge. How many plus charge will I get? We'll get two because I'm giving two. So we have Mg2 plus. Clear? Now we have two chlorine. So done. So chlorine has, uh, is the receiver here. Took one here, took one here. Now, so this is how a bond was formed. So I'm sure you uh, got a concept for uh, ionic bond. Now, there is a strong force of attraction between them. Clear? Because uh, they have already transferred. They have already, like, it's like sodium needs to throw and then uh, chlorine needs one electron from sodium. sodium. So it's like a strong relationship now. Clear? Okay, so if you are clear with this, we'll go to the properties of ionic compound. Clear? What type of compound do they have? What kind of properties do they have? Now, one important property about the ionic compound is they are a good conductor of electricity. Why they are a good conductor of electricity? Because they have a plus minus ions, right? While transferring, they have received plus and minus. So they are a very good conductor of electricity. And talking about their physical state, they are like a crystalline. They have a crystalline solid, clear? Crystalline solid. 
and also uh, on applying more pressure, they can uh, behave as a brittle, where they can be broken down into pieces. Clear? Now, let's talk about solubility for ionic compound. Ionic compound, they are soluble in water, okay? But they are insoluble in solvents like kerosene, uh, benzene, petrol, ether, and all. Clear? So you keep that in mind. Ionic compound, I'll repeat it again uh, for our listeners as well. Ionic compound, they are soluble in water. Clear? But they are insoluble in solvents like petrol, kerosene, benzene, etc. Clear? Okay, so I'm sure you have noted down all the three properties that I've given. Okay, we, can, we have more properties, but to make it more simple, I'm giving just three properties regarding the physical state, solubility, and also uh, they're good conductors of uh, electricity since they have this plus and minus ions. Clear? So if you are clear with the... Uh, so this is all about reaction between metals and non-metals, ionic bond and the properties. The next would be, uh, the next topic would be uh, occurrence of met metals. How do we get metal naturally? And how do we get the final products, the final products of metal which we get in the market? Clear? So we'll see the journey. So I'm sure you have noted down everything. So we'll start with our next topic, that is occurrence of metal. Okay. Students, our next topic is occurrence of metal. How do we get uh, metal naturally? Like, uh, so we get metal in earth crust and sea. But before that, do you remember the reactivity series which I have uh, explained in our first chapter? Okay, I'll just write in short form the reactivity series that is potassium, uh, sodium, chlorine, Okay, so in the first class, I have given you uh, a tricks as well from potassium. This is the symbol, okay? This is just the chemical symbol that I'm giving, but I've given the reactivity series of metal uh, in the decreasing order from potassium till gold. And I've also given a sentence for some students who will find difficult to remember this one. So I'm sure you have uh, gone through the series one by one because we need this for this chapter as well. Clear? Now, uh, if we look at this, uh, this is the most highly reactive one and it goes down, the less reactive. But here also in this chapter, what we'll do is we'll divide them into three groups. Clear? The higher reactivity one, the medium reactivity one, and the least reactive one. These are the higher reactivity one, these are the medium, and then these are the less reactive one. That means gold, silver are less reactive. Okay, now, uh, see, potassium, metals like potassium, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, and all, they are considered to be the highly reactive one. And you, uh, the, they are found in nature. In the, uh, ne they are never found. Okay. So students, these are the highly reactive metals, and they are found in a combined. Uh, they are always found in a combined form. That means you will never find uh, sodium or potassium or the highly reactive metal in a free state. Okay you'll see some ores attached with them. So, but metals like uh, silver and gold, gold, we, gold and platinum and all, we find them in a free state, clear? We just have to do some refining, or else we find them like uh, naturally gold. We don't see some ores attached with them, clear? And in the medium part, this is the medium one we get to see some sulfite, some carbonate ores attached with them. So, 
I'm sure you know now the uh, division even between the among among this reactivity series of metals. Okay, so how metals are, uh, what kind of steps do, do they have to go through to get the final product of metals? So, naturally metals, uh, when we find them like in nature, they are found with impurities like dust particles, sand, clay, and they are known as gain or matrix. Matrix, okay? So this is the impurities that we uh, find like in metals. So in this chapter, in this topic, what we are going to study is we will study attainment, attainment of pure metals from impure metals. So from impure metal, we are going to get a pure metal uh, through different steps. And how we are going to divide it? We are going to divide it according to the highly medium and then the least reactive. So uh, it's there in your textbook, but you can also note down this one along with me. So let's say concentration of ore. Concentration of ore. And then we'll divide into three groups. Now, metals of highly reactive. Okay? Metals of highly reactivity. That means the first one belongs to this top group. Okay? Now, the middle one is for the medium reactivity. So, it is for metals like zinc, iron, and lead and all. Clear? And this is for the least reactive. Least reactive. Now, the main concept here is, see, let's say this is a metal, okay? This is a metal. This is a metal. So we'll have either a sulfide or we'll have either a carbonate, okay? We have either a carbonate. So now first what we have to do is we have to reduce this one to metal oxide, okay? We have to reduce this one to metal oxide. Now we have to reduce this one. We have to remove this carbonate and we have to get oxide. So from metal sulfide or metal carbonate, we have to get metal oxide, metal oxide. And from metal oxide, at the end, we'll get a pure metal. At the end, we'll get a pure metal. And then pure metal will send for refining and then done. They are ready to use. So in this case, metals of high reactivity, that is like pot uh, potassium, sodium, uh, calcium, magnesium, and aluminum, they have to go electrolytic reduction. This is the easiest one. They are highly reactive, so what, they, what we have to do is we have to just pass an electric current in an aqueous solution, in a molten form. So, uh, like the same example, like NaCl, if we get like that, then we will pass an electric current and from there we'll obtain a sodium metal. Clear? So, okay, students, for metals, of high reactivity, the process is very simple. Now, we might have NaCl, but in order to get the sodium from this compound, they just have to go electrolytic reduction. Electrolytic reduction means just pass electric current here in a molten form, in a watery form, then we'll get sodium then we'll get a metal. And then at the end, we just have to do refining. Now, but in the medium reactivity, in the metals of medium reactivity, it is not, uh, it is not same like the first one. Here, we have to apply a different step. Here, we will get either, let's say, example, zinc sulfide. Zinc, naturally, you got in this form. 
Zinc is a metal, okay? Zinc is a metal, but you might get in this form, zinc sulfide. Zinc is a metal, but you can get in this form. See, zinc is a metal, you can get in the sulfide form, you can get in the carbonate form naturally. But what is our goal? Our goal is to get this zinc, but we are not going to get zinc directly. It has to go another, uh, we have to go like two process. Now, we have to go roasting and calcination. Roasting and calcination. So, roasting and calcination. Now, this roasting and calcination is very important. In order to reduce, in order to get zinc oxide, this sulfide has to go roasting process. Now, we are almost there from zinc oxide, the next step would be we'll get zinc. But how do we get zinc oxide from zinc sulfide roasting? When I say roasting, uh, you can note it down. I'll just say verbally, you can note it down. It is the process of heating sulfide ore in the presence of air. Clear? Roasting, let me repeat it, it is the pro process of heating a sulfide ore. That means this one, okay? In the presence of air. Roasting, you remember presence of air. Clear? Now, here, calcination is, it is the process of heating a carbonate ore. Okay, remember, C for calcination, C for carbonate, so that you won't get confused in exam. It is the process of heating a carbonate ore in the absence of air. Clear? Roasting means presence of air, calcination means absence of air. And then roasting is to do only for sulfide. And then calcination is for carbon. Okay, so now once we undergo this one, this zinc sulfide will uh, reduce to zinc oxide. Now, this zinc carbonate would reduce to zinc oxide. Now, that means we have metal oxide. From metal oxide to get a metal is very easy now. We just have to... Okay, uh, if you're done with this, I'll write over here. From zinc oxide, we just have to react with carbon. Carbon is a reducing agent, okay? Carbon. So now we get zinc and carbon monoxide. So now we got a pure metal that is zinc. So here in this process, it has to react with a reducing agent like carbon. So we got the pure metal now. Now let's see this zinc oxide. It, it will be the same, okay? So the same process goes for both uh, roasting and calcinations. Once they get this zinc oxide, we just have to react with carbon to get a pure metal. Done. Clear? Okay, now the next one would be uh, metals of the least reactive. Metals of least reactive. Now, let, for this, let's say cinnabar. Cinnabar is an ore of mercury. Clear? It is an ore of mercury. Cinnabar is an ore of mercury. So, how do we get uh, mercury from this cinnabar? Okay. okay, so students, now it is about the, the least reactive metals, okay? Least reactive metals. So I gave you this cinnabar, right? Cinnabar is actually a common name, but it is an ore of mercury. So HG here, HG. H like in house, G like in, uh, G like in Goba. HG. HGS means that it is mercury sulfide. So the common name is cinnabar. Now, but what our goal is, we want to get this HG. I want to separate this sulfate, sulfate out of mercury. So in this case, for the metals of the least reactive, they need roasting. Clear? Why they need roasting? Because they have this sulfate. If you have a sulfate, that means you need roasting. That means, roasting means, what did I say, students? Roasting means we have to burn this in the presence of air, okay? We have to burn this in the presence of air 
So if it's the presence of air means we'll apply oxygen here. And now from here we get done. We got mercury here. So we got our pure metal here. It has to go now refining purification. But uh, our goal to get a pure metal is already done. It has undergone a roasting process. So I just want to make you clear again, students. If along with a metal, if you have S, that means sulfide, then you have to apply roasting. That means presence of air. And if you have, say, uh, carbonate, if you have a carbonate ore, then you have to apply what? What process? You have to apply calcination. That means heating in the absence of air. In this case, you'll apply calcination. See, C for calcination, C for carbon. So you'll get zinc oxide and zinc, uh, clear? So student, please note down this equation. So this is how we get a pure metal. So we are done with the process of extracting the metal from their ores. We have divided into three parts. So you, I'm sure you are clear with this. Uh, now we have our next uh, and the last topic that is uh, corrosion, okay? But corrosion, I have explained for the first chapter as well. But uh, we have some other points to add up here in this chapter. So next point is corrosion. Students, if you remember like corrosion, it is uh, because of corrosion, metals get rust, right? Why it has to get rust? Because when metals are exposed to the air, oxidation, all this oxidizing take place. That's why uh, we can see that there's a change in the physical, physical state as well. Now, I have also given uh, different prevention uh, from metals to get like corrode, like galvanization, like greasing, like oiling. So this is same, you can apply here. But now one new thing that here we have to add is alloy, okay? Alloy, alloy is also an important part for this metal and non-metal. So that is alloy. The topic name is alloy. So what is an alloy? Alloy, it is a homogeneous mixture, okay, of uh, metals, non-metals, or metals and between metals. So it's a mixture. In a simple word, it's a mixture of metals. Now, uh, let me give you an example. Would be brass, B-R-A-S-S. -S. So when we hear this uh, word brass, it is a combination of two metals. What, what metals? It is? Copper plus zinc. So see, we have added two metals, copper and zinc. Together is giving brass. Where do we use? Kitchen utensils. Kitchen utensils are all made of this brass. Kitchen utensils. Now, uh, let's say bronze, okay? Bronze, bronze uh, is a combination. Bronze is also a combination of copper and tin, okay? Copper and tin together give bronze. Where do you use this bronze? Like for metals, as well as like for statues, big, big statues are all made of this bronze. So statues. Clear? So this alloy uh, is a homogeneous mixture of two or more metals, metals between non-metals. Example, bronze, uh, brass, bronze. Okay, okay. And then we also have many examples for these alloys, okay? Many examples for these alloys, but just let's keep it simple. Let's, you just write these two examples, clear? So we are done with these two chapters, uh, this third chapter for science. So in this chapter, let's go a quick recap what we have studied. We have studied physical, 
properties of metals, um, chemical properties of metals, physical properties of non-metals, chemical properties of non-metals. One important thing that we have studied here is ionic bond, which is uh, very important, the concept, clear? And uh, we have studied reaction between metals and non-metals, and uh, the reactivity series. What we have learned so far is elements, uh, the metals, arranging in the decreasing order. But today we have uh, discussed about three categories, even in this reactivity series. Highly reactive, moderate, the medium one, and the less reactive one. And uh, one thing, how metals are occurred in nature, clear? So metals, we found them with like impurities, we found them at H with ore, so we have to remove that ore, so we have to categorize them into three groups, highly, medium, and least, and then uh, we also, uh, for highly, yes, we have to apply electrolytic reduction. For moderate one, for the medium uh, elements, we have to apply roasting for sulfide ore, calcination for carbonate ore, then they will, uh, we will get metal oxide. So this metal oxide, we have to use a reducing agent like carbon to get a pure metal. After that, when we get pure metal, we can, uh, uh, we can send them for refining. Now, the third one is for the least reactive. We have taken example for uh, mercury, cinnabar. Then cinnabar, we obtained mercury from cinnabar, okay? Cinnabar is HGS. Mercury is Hg, so we obtained mercury from cinnabar. So since S is there, so we have to apply to roasting. So that's how we concluded with the chapter. Corrosion was the same topic which we have covered in the first chapter, so we did not go much in details, but all these chapters are related. Please note down the equation. You have to practice the equation, students, clear? Because in the next class, we will start with a new portion that is from your physics part. Uh, the name of the chapter will be light. So before, in the next class, we're gonna start the chapter directly with the light. So for chemistry, for now, we'll just, go, uh, we'll just do with this three chapter. So you have to go through, practice the chemical equation, uh, and then you have to, uh, solve the question that is given in your NCRT text as well. Okay, students, thank you so much. Uh, stay safe. See you in the next class.